I'm going to take you through a comparison of full fine tuning with LoRa fine tuning and quantized LoRa fine tuning. I'll also talk a little bit about the loft Q quantization method that's LoRa aware. Now, one of the things I want to focus on is how to choose the learning rate and the hyperparameters like the rank and the value of alpha when using LoRa, because this has a big influence on performance and on how close you're able to get to full fine tuning when using some of the LoRa or even quantized LoRa techniques. Throughout this video, I'm going to take you through a comparison of these techniques on Mistral 7B on the base model, where I have fine tuned it on a data set for 1000 rows. And here is a summary of the results. Uh, you can see on the y-axis the evaluation loss. So this is on a set of data that I have not used for the training. And I'm comparing here the full fine tuning approach with a LoRa approach, a quantized LoRa approach, and finally a LoRa aware quantized approach uh, called Loft Q. Now, as you'll see, the evaluation loss is highest in this case for the full fine tuning, and I'm actually able to do better with the LoRa fine tuning. Now that's not to say that I couldn't get the same low evaluation loss with full fine tuning, but when you consider a fixed number of rows, I'm able to converge faster on a lower loss by using LoRa. Now, when I use a quantized version of LoRa, you'll see that the loss is a little bit higher. So the performance is slightly less good, which we'd expect because quantization affects precision. And then last of all, I won't dwell too much on this in the video, but in principle, you should be able to cancel out some of the loss in precision by using a technique called loft Q. But as you can see, it actually performs a little bit worse in this scenario. I'll still talk you through the theory of loft Q though, because it has some insights on how these models work in terms of performance. I'm going to start off with a high level comparison of the three techniques here, uh, full fine tuning LoRa and QLoRa. Then I'm going to talk about how to, how to select uh, the correct learning rate. And I've actually made all of the runs with two different learning rates, 1e-4 e and 1e-5. E and you'll see just how important that impact is uh, on the evaluation loss and performance. I'll also talk a bit about choosing the rank and the alpha value for doing lower fine tuning. This is something that's uh, empirical largely, um, but I think we can do a better job of giving some guidance around how to select the values if it's a small model or a big model, a small data set or a big data set. I want to make a few comments then on how to maximize quality when you're using quantization. Quantization does affect the quality of fine tuning, but maybe not quite as much as you might think if you are using the right tricks. Um, it's very important to properly merge the adapters on top of the base model. And also, um, sometimes you can actually get quality improvement by quantizing because it reduces overfitting. So I'll talk about those two things. As I mentioned, I'll talk about the loft Q technique, lower aware quanting. Um, it's quite interesting because in principle, it should be able to get back um, a lot of the precision loss that's involved in quantizing. But in practice, I found it difficult and I'll show you um, the results I had on that. I'll go through uh, one script run through. I'll focus on a QLORA case using the unsloth library and I'll do it on tiny llama so it's very fast. And then last of all, I'll take you through the results once more of all of these techniques and we'll do some manual examination of the kinds of prompts, uh, responses, uh, rather completions we get to the test prompts I've created. So let's start off with a high level overview of full fine tuning versus LoRa and QLoRa. So I have a table here and let's consider a 1 billion parameter model, maybe like Tiny Llama. Uh, if you want to think about a bigger model, just scale all these numbers by that amount. And on the columns, I have full fine tuning, LoRa and QLoRa. And the first way in which they differ is by the VRAM that you need to fine tune these models. As I talked about in my fine tuning on multiple GPUs video recently, you need way more VRAM for full fine tuning because you have to store the optimizer states, which are typically 32 bit states, and you need to store the gradients. And this results in requiring VRAM that goes well beyond just storing the model parameters by itself. So the big saving with LoRa is that by making pretty much all of the parameters in the model frozen and not training them, and instead training adapters that are much, much smaller, uh, you reduce greatly the size of the optimizer states and gradients that need to be stored. So most of the VRAM you need is to load the base model. Now QLoRa further reduces the VRAM required because it quantizes the base model. And if you quantize from 16 to four bits, that's roughly a four time saving. 
So here you have the number of parameters that are trained. In full fine tuning, it's you know generally 100% of the parameters are close. In LoRa, the adapters will typically account for often less than 1% of the original model parameters. There is one exception though, and that's if you decide to train certain layers uh, without applying LoRa to them. This is a common thing to do to train the embedding layers and sometimes the norms, which is important if you want to change, uh, for example, the chat format. Um, it's often necessary there to train the embeddings and those are not going to be trained as LoRa. So that increases the number of parameters, sometimes up into the single digits if you're working, especially with a smaller model. If you're working with a very large model, the embeds and norms will be a smaller percentage of the total parameters. So even with LoRa plus some other trainable parameters like embeddings and norms, it'll still be only about 1% or so of the total original parameters. Now in QLoRa, it's mechanically the same, uh, which modules you're going to train. So it would be the same number as you are going to train in LoRa more or less. When it comes to training time, the big difference is again between full fine tuning and both LoRa and QLoRa. LoRa and QLoRa are going to be similar in training time. There is um, going to be some dequantization of matrices in the QLoRa case. You dequantize from the 4-bit back out to 16-bit, and that can add some extra calculations, but generally they're going to be similar in fine-tuning time. The full fine-tuning is going to be longer for two reasons. One is that the back propagation pass is going to be um, slower because you've many more parameters to update. You've got to parameter update nearly all of the parameters instead of a small subset. But the bigger, or I don't know about bigger, but the other significant reason why full fine tuning is slower is because when you have more parameters that are being fine tuned, you need to use a lower learning rate. Um, you're operating in a higher dimensional space. And if you use the same high learning rate, you're just going to start, you know, cutting through hills and valleys. Um, and because you need a lower learning rate for full fine tuning, it can make it slower to converge. Whereas using a smaller number of parameters allows you to use a higher fine tuning rate and get the fine tuning done faster. When it comes to quality, a few differences here. Full fine tuning, because you're tuning so many parameters, it's possible to just overfit. You get your model to exactly match the data, but it doesn't generalize to examples within your evaluation set. LoRa, by contrast, because it um, is going to fine tune these adapters that are higher level representations of the knowledge, this can lead to a more stable and accurate and less under less overfitting fine tuning process. QLoRa has many of the characteristics of LoRa, except because it's quantized, you can lose precision. And so it can lead to a loss of knowledge that was there in the base model and also to a lower quality uh, fine tune. Although that is mitigated to some degree because the adapters are actually always or generally in 16 bits. Those are not quantized. It's the base model that's quantized. So you do actually have kind of granular control within the lower, lower adapters themselves to ingrain knowledge. It's just that the base model is going to suffer in terms of performance because you're reducing the precision there in those base weights. So when you're doing full fine tuning, the big difference is you have many, many more trainable parameters. This gives you more precision, but can lead to more overfitting. And you need to operate at a lower learning rate, which means that you're going to take longer in order to do the training. When it comes to LoRa, this reduces your trainable parameters, reduces overfitting potentially, and allows you to hit a higher learning rate, which means your training will be done quicker. So with full fine tuning, you can think of every matrix uh, within your language model. And I've just picked one matrix here, thousand by thousand, and you would forward propagate through all the matrices, calculate the loss, and then you will use that loss to back propagate and you will update every parameter within this matrix and all the other matrices. By contrast with LoRa, you will forward propagate through all of the matrices, um, but you keep those matrices frozen when you back propagate. So you don't update the base weights. Instead, you update these adapters. And the adapters are structured to have a certain uh, height here, which uh, is called the rank. It's the number of linearly independent rows within the matrix. So you set up uh, two adapters of rank OR, which I've chosen to be eight here. And these adapters together uh, can be multiplied with B transpose times A in order to give a matrix that is the same size as the original base model. And by doing this, when you have these two small adapters trained and at the end of training, you combine these by multiplying them, you can superimpose that, uh, that combined matrix on top of the original weight matrix to get and merge your final 
uh, fine-tuned model. And obviously this reduces your parameters significantly because instead of having a thousand by a thousand parameters, as in this matrix, you would have a thousand by eight and then times two for A and B. Now, the way these are initialized is often with either A or B initialized uh, to non-zero and the other one initialized to zeros. So that at the start of your fine tuning, this product of A times B is going to be zero. And so you're just starting with a forward propagation through the original weights. But as you back propagate and update these adapters, the product of A times B will move away from zero. And that's what provides the fine tuning. Now, QLORA is the same as LORA. It's just that your weight matrices of your base model are going to be quantized. So instead of representing them in 16 bits, they'll be um, basically moved to the nearest four bit tick. And this means that you're losing precision because instead of being able to represent a granularity of 16 bits, you're representing a granularity of four bits. So the forward pass will now only go through a four bit network. But notice that when you backward pass and update the adapters, these are actually typically 16-bit matrices, so there's precision there in the fine-tuning itself, but you can lose accuracy on the base model itself, and that's where the damage is done on the quantization. Now, whether you're using QLORA or LORA, there is the same rule that applies when you're thinking about setting the rank. If you need more trainable parameters because you have a more complicated data set, for example, then you want to increase the rank to have more trainable parameters and allow for a more complex fit or updating of the model. There's one other case where you might want a higher rank as well, and that's if you're using a small model. If you have a small model like Llama 1.1 billion, well, if you set the rank to be low, that's going to be an incredibly low number of parameters that you have to fine tune. And so to have kind of some minimum number of parameters, you might want to set the rank a bit higher for these smaller models to ensure you've got enough parameters to get the fit you need. Now, if you're working with a very large model like Llama 70B, well, in that case, even a small uh, rank will generate a very large number of trainable parameters because in Llama 70B, this initial matrix will be much larger. So the product of say eight times a larger number for the width is going to be a large number of trainable parameters. So to recap, Generally, I would think you want a larger rank if you need to embed more information or have a more subtle representation of the information you're going to build into the model, or if you're trying to fine tune a smaller language model where you need to ensure there's a minimum number of trainable parameters. I want to talk now about choosing the learning rate and the hyperparameters alpha and or. So the general rule still applies uh, for either full fine tuning or for lower fine tuning that the more trainable parameters you have, the lower the learning rate that you should be using because you're in a higher dimensional space and you have to take your time as you're going over those hills and valleys of optimization. So what we need to do for LoRa is to lower the learning rate that's being used for each of the LoRa adapters we've created. And the way that is set up is by setting it equal to alpha divided by OR, where OR is the rank you've chosen, multiplied by the learning rate that you would have used in a full fine tuning. So if L or here on the right is the learning rate you would have used in a full fine tuning, and in LoRa fine tuning, you use fewer parameters because you're only training the adapters, that means we need to have a higher learning rate. And to have a higher learning rate than L or, it means alpha over or needs to be greater than one. So alpha needs to be greater than or. And so this is why you see uh, empirically for whatever OR people will suggest, whether it's eight or 32, they'll often suggest an alpha that's at least the value of OR and often two or four times larger. Now this relationship here, which is just the setup of LoRa adapters, if you're using uh, hugging face transformers, for example, and pretty much any other library, this kind of suggests there should be some relationship between the learning rate of adapters and one over OR, but actually there is a study that's been done called Rank Stabilized LoRa. You can check out the paper here. And it turns out a more accurate relationship um, would be to scale it with one over the square root of OR. So what this is saying is that as you increase the value of OR, you should be reducing the learning rate you're using for adapters, but you should reduce it more slowly than just an inverse relationship with OR. So let's go through an example of how to set up some of these hyperparameters. And I'll go through the example for um, a Mistral 7B model. Uh, so the first thing we're going to use is we're going to use this 
rank stabilized LoRa. That's done by setting use or s LoRa to true when getting LoRa adapters. And I'll show that in the code later on. It's the only change that needs to be made when you're loading the adapters. Now, first we need to think of how we're gonna set the learning rate. And what I suggest is to set it based on what you see in the information, hopefully a paper of how the model was trained. Uh, for example, if you have the LAMA paper here, you can see uh, the learning rates that were being used in fine tuning LAMA 7B, which is uh, pretty similar to Mistral. So here it's uh, 3E minus four, and you can search through and find different learning rates that are used at different stages of the training. Uh, for example, here there are more details explaining how a cosine learning rate schedule is used. So even if you see that the initial training rate was 3E minus four, that rate is falling during the training and by the end of the training, and that's the model we're often starting with, the learning rate is much lower. It'll be 10 times lower, so 3E minus five. So based on that, for Mistral, what I did was choose value of 1E minus five. Next up, we're gonna set the rank. Now, if working with small data sets or large models, um, often for function calling, I'll just use for function calling fine tuning a uh, rank of about eight. Now, if you want to have more granularity in what you're gonna embed as knowledge, or if you're working with a very small model, maybe you'd pick 32 or 68. In this example here, I'm gonna fine tune for a thousand rows on um, a data set um, that is used for um, SFT, and I'm gonna use 32 as my rank. Next up is choosing the value of alpha. So to think about this, let's go back and look at the equation for rank stabilized LoRa. Now, here we have the rescaled, uh, the rescaled learning rate, which has been used for the adapters, and it's been scaled by alpha over square root of R times the learning rate that would be used for the base model. Now, if you can consider a limit here, let's consider a limit where the rank is basically chosen to be as large as the original matrices. So let's go back to where we've set up the rank here. And imagine a case where we're gonna pick a rank um, such that it's basically the same size as the original matrix, which wouldn't be reducing our trainable parameters, but let's just think about this limit. So OR here is basically going to be the same as the characteristic dimensions of that model. Now, what is the characteristic dimension of matrices in a model? Well, if you go to the files for a given model, and here I have uh, the tiny LAMA model actually, you can take a look at the config.json file and you should see here, there'll be a list of the um, embeddings size and there should be a list of the intermediate size and the hidden size. So here you can see um, the intermediate size is about five and a half thousand and the hidden size is about uh, 2000. So this kind of gives you some kind of estimate of what the characteristic size of these matrices are that you're applying adapters to. And so you can think about what if we picked a value of OR that was instead of being eight, it was on the order of 1000. Now, if we take that back to the rescale LoRa equation here, if we consider the rank being pretty much the full size of matrices, well, if that's the case, we should be using an adapter learning rate that's equal to the learning rate. So if we use a rank that's just the full matrix, then LOR rescaled should be equal to LOR. And if that's the case, alpha over square root of OR should be equal to one. So in the limit where the rank is the same size as the matrices, alpha over square root of OR, I think reasonably should, should possibly be one, um, which means that alpha probably makes sense to set it as the square root of the characteristic dimension of the matrices in that language model. So for example, if you have a language model that has a characteristic matrix rank of 1000, then you should be setting alpha equal to the square root of that characteristic dimension. And by characteristic dimension, I actually mean the rank. So it would be the number of uh, linearly independent rows within the typical matrix that is being fully fine tuned. So if that value is about a thousand, then you should be setting alpha equal to a square root of a thousand, which is very roughly uh, 30. And within the Mistral tutorial, I'm gonna set it equal to 32 for the value of alpha. And by setting alpha in this way, it allows us to basically set it independently based on the number, the characteristic dimension of the model. And from there, when we adjust the rank, the adapter's learning rate will naturally be adjusted according to the square root, uh, not this equation, because we're using rank stabilized. It'll naturally be adjusted according to the square root of the rank that we select. And once you have alpha set, 
what you can do now is train and take a look at your training loss and evaluation loss. And if you're seeing that they're smooth, the eval loss is smoothly going down, the um, training loss is not bouncing too much, then maybe you can increase the learning rate a little bit. And if it's bumpy, you can decrease the learning rate a little bit. So as a quick example for Mistral 7B, um, perhaps you set the learning rate at 1E minus 5, which is kind of the lower end of the learning rates in the LAMA 2 7B paper. Then uh, set the rank at 32 because I want to ingrain quite an amount of data. It's more than just fine tuning on 10 or 100 rows of data. And I'm going to set the alpha, um, which should be roughly the square root of the rank of the matrices uh, in the base model. Probably I could set it a little bit higher, but I'm going to use uh, 32 here. And um, then we're ready for fine tuning with the one following note, which is that it's common when doing LoRa fine tuning particularly for chat fine tuning, it's common to separately train some of the original matrices. So you will freeze pretty much all of the matrices with the exception of uh, LM head and embed tokens. And what this does is train the embedding so they're able to adapt in shape and allow you to get the new uh, chat template, the new conversation format that you want for the fine tune. So there are going to be two things that are trained. One is the lower adapters and then a small sliver of the original matrices will actually be trained in full precision. Now note that those are going to be trained at the learning rate that we set of 1e minus 5. It's only the adapter parameters that are trained at this rescaled learning rate here. Next up, I want to make a few quick comments on using quantization because this allows you to reduce your VRAM a lot, but the problem usually is that you lose quality. However, all is not lost. You can actually minimize the quality loss quite a bit um, if you're aware of how to properly merge the adapters, which seems simple, but it's actually not a trivial thing to do correctly. So two tips if you're going to do a quantized LoRa fine tuning, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, probably cuts the VRAM you need by a factor of about uh, three to four. So the first thing to note is that QLoRa is not necessarily worse than LoRa for two reasons. One is that the adapters themselves are represented in 16 bits. So even though... Um, and here I have messed up my representation. But even though you have the base that's going to be in four bits, you do have a full 16 bits for the adapters to get precise representations of the data that you're fine tuning. Um, but moreover, regularization, um, which is actually kind of reducing precision in some ways, can sometimes be of benefit because it reduces overfitting. Uh, one way to think about that is if you consider five different dots, red dots here, they're just randomly spaced data points. Think of them as your underlying data set. And think of the blue line here as a model that is going to overfit. So here I've just put a polynomial of degree five, which can fit through all through those points. Now consider on the other hand, a bad model or very inaccurate model. So say just a linear or a fine fit, and that's the green line here. And the green line obviously doesn't capture a lot of the nuance of these five points. Um, so we consider it uh, an imprecise model. So if you took this polynomial of degree five and you quantized it down to, from five to two in polynomial uh, order, then that quantization is going to lose a lot of accuracy. However, what can be nice is if you have this little bit of uh, quantization or what's called regularization. So if you move from degree five to degree three in this uh, diagram here, you'll see that you get some of the nuance of the data points, but you're not overfitting the data points. So it's likely to maybe generalize a bit better. And so what I'm doing here is um, drawing an analogy with quantization, because if you have uh, overfitting, so you have these really precise parameters, sometimes by moving to a lower precision, you're able to reduce that overfitting. However, if you are missing some outliers and they're not well represented, you will just lose precision overall, and that can bring you to the green line. So I'm not saying that using Coolora will generally improve your performance, but just be aware that it's not directly, it's not solely reducing performance. It can have some regularization benefits. Now, the second tip, uh, which is possibly more important from a practical standpoint, is that when you finish training with uh, Coolora, what you're left with is the following. So you're left with a base model that hasn't changed, but that is in four bits. And then these adapter models that are in 16 bits. And if you want to make sure that you maintain that information, 
you have to be really careful when you merge the product of these two LoRa matrices on top of the base model. It's not possible to just naively squash them together because they're in different precisions. So what you need is the code in the background needs to take the 4-bit model, upcast it, it's called upcasting, back to 16 bits, and then merge those two 16 bits. That's the only theoretical way that you're going to get the same performance that you finish training with. And by contrast, what you easily might do without thinking is you might reload the base model in 16 bits, and then you might apply the adapters. And that's slightly different because when you upcast 4-bit weights, they're not going to match their original 16-bit representations. And that slight difference, um, which is already accounted for by the adapters, that slight difference is then going to be a little bit of noise on merging those adapters. So you need a program that can upcast these 4-bit weights back to 16-bit and then apply the adapters. And the one program I'm aware of that does that now, or the one library, is the Unslot library. Um, so if you are using Unslot fine-tuning, which also accelerates your fine-tuning, um, it's a great option because it properly merges the dequantized base, weight, base weights with the adapter weights, and that means you don't lose precision. Just a few notes if you do use Unsloth. So it's currently for single GPU. It's not for fully sharded data parallel or distributed data parallel. I think this might be in testing with Llama Factory, though. Um, only a limited number of models are supported. Now, there are models like Quen and DeepSeq that can be Llamified, so you can actually train them because Mistral and Llama are supported. Um, model loading is a little bit different. I'll show you some code on that. Um, adapter loading is different. Um, but one of the beauties, and by the way, it's, it's quite simple. It's just a line of code change. Um, and one of the beautiful things is that LoRa merging and saving um, is just one line. It's automatically done in one line, which is very nice. And I should just say here that the models that are not supported yet are like Mistral or the Cohere Command Plus model, or say the Mistral 8x22B either. So with that, um, we've completed the main approaches, full fine tuning, LoRa and QLoRa. I want to make a few quick comments on LoftQ, which is a LoRa aware quantization method that theoretically can lead to improvement. I won't dwell on it though, because I didn't find that it gave uh, improvement in practice. Then I'm going to run through one script for unslot fine tuning with QLoRa. I won't run through the full fine tuning case because it's better covered in my video on fine tuning with multiple GPUs. Then I'll come back and I'll take a look at some of the results from 7B fine tuning with the different methods. And we'll take a look at some of the completions in response to the prompts. So first, just a few notes on the loft Q method. As I've, as I've explained already, when you're using QLoRa, you have this base matrix that's quantized, and then you have these adapters. And the adapters usually are uh, initialized for one of them to be zeros and the other to be non-zeros. But you can do better than that. And the way you can do better is by initializing these two matrices to be non-zero when you multiply them, and to be non-zero in a way that they minimize the quantization error. So if you lose a chunk of accuracy from a weight because you've quantized it, you basically compensate for that within uh, the 16-bit LoRa adapters immediately when they're initialized. So what that results in is when you initialize uh, the model with the adapters, you kind of lose precision on the base, but that error is largely made up for by how you initialize the adapters. It's quite a beautiful idea in theory. Um, so here, as an example, with just one single weight, if you have the number 327, which in binary is this number here, you could quantize that um, down. Now, I'm assuming I'm quantizing a variety of weights at the same time, so I'll have a scale that's going to map from 16 bits down onto 4 bits. So if I have a scale of uh, 32.5, um, which I've just picked arbitrarily here, but if I have a scale that's used for quantizing a set of weights, then my 4-bit representation is going to be 1010. Zero, one zero. And so if it's 1010, zero, one zero, that number is 10. So that's the binary representation of 10. So 10 times 32.5, it's actually 32.4888 that, um, that I've used for scaling. That would give me 325. And because 325 is not equal to 327, we'll make up for that difference within the adapters. So in the 16-bit adapters, we'll try and set them up so that B product A is going to give this binary number, which is two, uh, zeros and then one zero. And so we have the two that's over in the adapters and the three, two, five in the base. So together you can see how this can represent 
um, a 16-bit number quite accurately of 327. Now, if you want to use this technique for initializing, you actually don't load the model in 4-bit, you load it in 16 bits. But then when loading the PEFT model, you have to pass in a loft queue configuration, which I'll show you in the code. And then you have to initialize. Um, you can also initialize the weights as being loft queue as opposed to being uh, Gaussian. Now, in principle, because you initialize them this way, your model should start off the training with um, similar overall weights as um, the full precision model. Um, but what I found is that when I fine tune this model in practice, um, I actually don't get the same precision. I actually get a little bit worse or similar to just standard quantized LoRa. It's time now for a quick script run through. I'm going to do this on RunPod by SSHing into an instance. If you want to see the instructions, I recommend checking out my fine tuning video on multiple GPUs because I use the same approach to connect in to RunPod. The repository I'm using is the Trellis advanced fine tuning repo. Uh, you can purchase lifetime access to this, including future tutorials I upload over at trellis.com. That's T-R-E-L-1-L-T-R-E-L-I-S.com. Now, previously I worked on the multi-GPU branch. That's what you can use if you want to do full fine tuning of a model uh, like Lama 7B. Um, but I've now created a branch called Unsloth, which allows for fine tuning with a script using the Unsloth library. So let's head over to VS Code, where I'm connected in to a RunPod instance. And we'll take a look at the README file. Just before you get started, you do need to install Unsloth and a series of other packages. I have a script here that allows you to do that. It'll first uh, make sure that you reinstall Torch to the correct version. And once that's installed, it will run the Unsloth installation itself. Once you have Unsloth installed, you can, like in the multi-GPU branch, you can run a series of tests on a model that you specify in the YAML file, and that will run the model. Uh, it'll run a series of prompts that you've defined within the data folder here. It will run those by the model and generate a set of outputs that you can manually inspect. And then you can also run uh, Python train.py, which is what we're going to do here. So let's set up some configuration. And the model I'm going to fine tune is going to be the tiny llama base model. And the reason for that is because I want something quick for this tutorial. So let's uncomment the tiny llama model slug and also the tokenizer slug, although that's not strictly required because the program will automatically pull the tokenizer from the model slug. Now this base model isn't chat fine tuned and I want to fine tune it in a Mistral or Llama 2 style. So I'm going to use the chat template that's defined here in the data folder, right within te chat templates. Let's fine tune in four bit. So let's set that to true. And we'll set the data type to bfloat16 because I'm on an A6000, which is an Ampere architecture. If you're on a T4 in Collab, uh, then you would be using uh, bfloat16, not, sorry, float16, not bfloat16. Now for testing, we're going to test on a series of messages in the data folder here. These messages contain uh, two questions. What are the planets in the solar system? And give me some Python code to add the first five numbers in the Fibonacci series. So that will be the test that we run for um, manual inspection. Now the data set we'll use is Argilla DPO Mix 7K. It's a DPO data set, so it has both chosen and rejected responses. We're just going to use the chosen responses uh, but we're going to use those chosen responses for SFT. If you take a look at the data set, uh, it's public. You'll see here uh, the chosen and the rejected, and you'll see how they're formatted as a series of messages. Now, the nice thing about SFT Trainer is that you can just pass in um, a series of messages like this. And if the column has been named messages, which my code will rename the column as, then the SFT Trainer will automatically apply the chat template to each of the rows within that data set. Okay, so moving on here, um, when we're doing training, we're going to use uh, the main branch of that data set and the training split. The column name that I'll rename to messages is chosen and the max rate rows, which is how many rows I wanna train on is 1000, just to keep it short. It would be better, of course, to use the full 7000. And for the validation set, we're gonna use the test split and we'll use uh, 128 rows. Now we're going to use LoRa. In fact, you must use LoRa if you're going to uh, do fine tuning with Unsloth. And we're not going to use LoftQ here, although I'll show you some results of that later. The LoRa modules we're going to train are listed here. 
Um, I think alternatively, you can actually just type in all linear and it will fine tune all of those linear modules, but I'll leave the list as is. As I mentioned earlier, this is a chat fine tuning. So it's important to fine tune the embed tokens and the LM head. So I've listed those as under trainable modules. They won't have lower adapters applied, but they will be marked as trainable. So they'll be updated in the backward pass and they'll account for a few percent of the model because it's a small one. So the embed tokens and LM head are actually a meaningful percentage of tiny lamb. Now for LoRa, or I'm going to use uh, 32. Um, I'm setting this high because it's a small model. So I want to make sure there are enough parameters being updated. And for LoRa Alpha, um, if the characteristic dimension of this model, tiny lamb is about a thousand, which probably is reasonable. I want this to be square root, so 32. So that's fine. And um, yeah, just goes to show, I, I probably should have set this lower alpha a bit higher when I was fine tuning Mistral um, because the characteristic rank of the matrices within it are probably a bit larger. But either way, um, you'll see the results worked out fine. And here I'm going to use RS LoRa. So this is the rank stabilized LoRa. I'll set that to true so that uh, depending on the rank, the learning rate of the adapters will be scaled with one over the square root. Now I'm on an A6000, which is 48 gigabytes of VRAM. And I've just found uh, empirically by running the script a few times that I can fit a training batch of eight and um, validation batch of the same size. And I like to have the product of gradient accumulation times the batch size to be equal to 32. So I want a virtual batch size of 32. That usually gives a good kind of average of uh, rows so that my noise is kind of averaged out nicely and stabilizes the training. So we will evaluate. So I've set this uh, do eval to true. We're just going to run through the data set once. So the number of epochs is one. My learning rate is one E minus five. Um, I probably can increase the learning rate a little bit since Llama, uh, tiny Llama is, let's see, it's one billion versus seven billion. I could maybe uh, increase this by square root of seven, I'm going to propose. <laughs> so maybe I'll set it as uh, 2.5 E uh, minus five, something a little bit higher than I use for Mistral. BF16 is true. So we're using BrainFloat16 because I have the Ampere architecture GPU. I'm going to use a constant uh, scheduler. You could use cosine if you're using a bigger data set. Um, you don't want the constant learning rate as the model is already converging. But since I'm only using a fraction of the data set, I can probably use this constant. And I'm going to fine tune on a max sequence length of 2048 using gradient checkpointing in order to reduce um, my VRAM. And um, Using reentrancy, this parameter here, um, it makes sure that we use an optimized graph for when we recompute um, the activations on the backward pass. So this helps accelerate uh, the gradient checkpointing. Now the saving settings here are going to be tiny llama and SFT on sloth, learning rate of uh, 2.5 E minus five, and we're going to use RSQ lore. So rescaled, sorry, um, rank stabilized, quantized LoRa. And with that, uh, we should be ready if I press save and I can write Python train.py. And while this is running, I'll take you through the script just so that we can see some of the, the code. The model is just being downloaded right now. It uses a HF underscore transfer, which gets very high download rates. Um, you can see it's downloading at over hundred megabytes per second, sometimes even up to one gigabyte per second. So let's take a quick look at the training script. Um, while that training starts, you can see here, it's going to have 32 steps um, because we have a virtual batch size of 32 and we have a thousand rows. Um, so that training is underway and there's going to be eval every fifth of the run. So there'll be eval every four, uh, sorry, every eight, uh, sorry, eval every fourth, every quarter of the run. So eval every eight steps. All right. So here's train.py. A few things I want to highlight here. And um, when we load the model, we do it with the tokenizer at once. This is how you load with unslot using fast language model. You also pass in the max sequence length when you do that. That's, um, that's useful because it sets uh, the max length uh, for the tokenizer. Um, now the D type, if you set it to none, then unslot will automatically detect that we've an ampere GPU and it will set that to be float 16. Now you can see here that I'm loading in 4-bit if my use 4-bit in the YAML is true. 
and not config use loft queue. And that's because if we want to use loft queue, we actually have to load in 16 bit. So it will not load in 4 bit if we're using loft queue, it'll load in full precision. Next, we set up the beginning of sequence token and then we set the pad token. And next, we set the chat template. I mentioned I wanted to use the Mistral style chat template. Once that's applied to the tokenizer, um, that's going to be used automatically by SFT Trainer. Um, so it's going to template all of our input messages automatically when we pass them in, provided they've got the name messages. So the splits are train and validation, as I mentioned. We're just loading each of those two splits here. And um, what I'm doing now is I'm checking that if there's not a messages column in the data set, uh, which there isn't, because uh, you can check that out here. If there isn't, then it's going to generate a messages column um, by drawing from our uh, chosen column. And that's because I've spec specified chosen in the YAML here as the column that we want to use uh, for the training. So it's just set up here. All right, so next we just check the model has got the pad token matching the tokenizer. And moving on, we're going to um, load the loft queue configuration if we're using loft queue. Now, uh, the LoRa aware quantization is done iteratively. So what we'll do is it will kind of load the model, generate the adapters, um, check the quantization loss. Then it will try to do an iteration and improve that loss. So you can control the number of iterations here. If you increase that, you should in principle get a lower quantization loss and better matching adapters. If we're not using loft queue, then we're going to set the loft queue config to none and we're going to initialize the lower weights with true instead of with loft queue. The way to apply adapters with unsloth is to use a fast language model, get PEFT model. Here's where we specify the rank, the LoRa alpha, the modules that we want to apply the adapters to, the modules we want to save that aren't going to have LoRa's adapted. Um, that's going to be LM embed and um, the embed tokens modules. The LoRa dropout and bias have to be set to zero and none for unsloth. It doesn't support other values, but that's not a big deal. Gradient checkpointing, we set the true here. Um, you can set a random state, which is related to how the LoRa adapters are initialized if you're not using um, loft queue. Here you can see we're using rescaled LoRa. And lastly, you can see the loft queue configuration being inputted right here. Next up, we're going to take in all of the training arguments. These are copied in from my YAML file. Notice here how we run evaluation every quarter of an epoch. And there is a small warm up in the learning ratio as well. For the first 5%, we're going to ramp up the learning race rate, which can help with stability. Although I don't think it's a big uh, thing here in this case. Once all of those training configurations are set up, we have the SFT trainer here, supervised fine tuning trainer. We've passed in the max sequence length, the model, the tokenizer, the training args, and then the training and the validation set. Now you can additionally opt to add in some noise. This will add noise to the embeddings. In certain cases, this noise can also serve as a form of regularization and avoid overfitting. I've tried it out. I haven't tried it for this Mistral run, so I don't know exactly if it would uh, help with the performance in this case. Next, um, we're going to run training. And once the training is done, we're going to set up a name for the model and we're going to then save that model. And I'll just show you here a few options that are taken from uh, the Unsloth GitHub repo. And one of which is to save the pre-trained model merged. And you can choose how you want to merge it and this is a beautiful thing here. You can just choose to um, save it as a merge 16-bit model. What this does is it um, ups, up, upcasts the base model and then it merges in the adapters. And this is, this is beautiful. It's not currently possible with the Hugging Face Transformers library, but it what, it's what allows you to achieve uh, the performance. Uh, rather, it allows you to avoid any loss in performance due to model merging. So here the training uh, has been completed. If you wish, you can uh, check out the run. So I'll just head over to uh, my browser and paste in that weights and biases run. So here you have a graph of the evaluation loss. It's um, falling fairly smoothly here. And you should see that the training loss, um, you know, may maybe a little bit bumpy, so potentially some room for uh, reducing the value of learning rate here, but certainly not going completely out of control and uh, the eval loss is looking good. So I'll head back now to VS Code and we can check out the saved file. 
So you'll remember I have saved that file uh, according to uh, this name here. So RSQLaura, and I should see it saved now underneath um, the Trellis folder. Indeed, here it is right here. So I'll just copy that relative path and I'm going to paste that in right at the top. And I'm going to do that so I can run a quick test. So I've saved that. I'm going to actually turn off um, 4-bit because we've saved the model in 16-bit, so I'm able to inference it in 16-bit. And if I write Python test, um, test.py, that's going to start uh, evaluation on the model on those questions that we uh, previously were checking out. Now, a little earlier, I ran the same questions on the base model. And the base model, since it's not fine-tuned, if you ask it what plants are in the solar system, it repeats the question and then um, it actually includes Pluto and starts repeating the question. And when it comes to Fibonacci code, it doesn't do anything about Fibonacci. It, it imports and prints numbers from one to six. So let's see if we do any better. Um, it looks like the output has been printed now uh, to my output folder. So I need to find the exact run, which is this one. And let's take a look at the generator response. So Sun, uh, generator response, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Um, so it's not quite right. The Sun is obviously not a planet and Pluto is no longer a planet. Tiny Lama thinks Pluto is a planet though, so that's not necessarily the fine tuning's fault. And um, you can see it's very well formatted though. It finishes with an end of sequence token. And then for the Fibonacci series, you can see that uh, it's generating some code. And here... Um, it's returning n and recursively calculating the Fibonacci number. So this is actually printing out the fifth Fibonacci number. It's not printing out the sum. So it's kind of on the right topic, which is better than the base model, but it's not printing out the sum. And this can be the characteristic of uh, weaker models. So that's a quick overview of Tiny Llama, a run through of the fine tuning. What I want to do next is show you some results on a larger model and walk you through how uh, the different approaches perform. And now for the last part of the video where I'll very quickly look manually, manually inspect some of the results we have from the different fine tuning methods. And the ones I wanna show you are the full fine tuning of Mistral, the LoRa, QLoRa, and then LoftQ. So I'll go through each of those, but first I just wanna note that I ran the same, um, the exact same parameters at two learning rates. I ran at one E minus five in gray, and I ran at one E minus four. And you can see that in the full fine tuning case, actually the loss was really high. It was 7.41, way off the charts. And actually the completion is complete garbage. So the effect of learning rate is clearly very important. And it's possible that if you use a lower learning rate, um, that may well generate better results. Uh, sometimes using a higher learning rate will generate better results. But generally the higher learning rates um, the more likely that you are to have these crazy, just um, nonsensical types of responses from the model. Now, the pattern with these, if you compare between the 1e-5 and 1e-4, the four methods all compare very similarly. So to keep things simple, we'll stay focused on the 1e-5 chart. And you'll see here how the full fine tuning doesn't reach as low of a loss um, over the same number of steps as RS LoRa. And that's because you can basically accelerate training with LoRa by increasing the adapter learning rates. Likewise, RSQ LoRa gets to a lower loss, although the loss is higher than LoRa because of the quantization. And unfortunately, when I used LoftQ, it didn't lead to any improvement when I did one iteration. Doing uh, three iterations of the quantization during initiation of the adapters actually didn't improve things further. It made things worse, so I haven't even shown it here. It's instructive, though, to look at some of these results manually. So first of all, let's take a look at um, the LoRa example. So we'll take a look at learning rate of 1e minus 5. And here you can see the planets in the solar system um, consist of the sun and eight planets. So that's beautiful. Mistral gets that correct in the case of LoRa. And the code for writing the Fibonacci numbers um, so it generates the sequence and it actually adds up those five numbers and then it finishes off nicely. So Laura does a very nice job um, in the case of Mistral. Now, moving to QLaura, 
Um, the generated planets, again, are the eight planets. There's an extra sentence at the end, but it's getting the answer correct. And when we move to the Fibonacci code, now for QLaura, you can see that it's getting it correct as well. So QLaura here is performing very well. It's getting both uh, of the answers correct as Laura was. Now, if I take a look at the loft queue approach with one iteration, you'll see that the planets um, are also being listed correctly. There's a short sentence at the end, but that's still correct. Um, but when we look at the Fibonacci code here, um, it's just printing the first five numbers. It's not actually adding them together. So there's a loss in accuracy here when we use one iteration of loft queue. And um, I do have three iterations of loft queue here as well. And if you do three iterations, the generator response becomes very verbose. It gives the planets, but it then starts blabbing on about each of the planets. And when I look at the Python code, um, I believe it does actually add up the numbers. So the performance is a little bit better on that front, but I can see from the evaluation loss, uh, which I haven't shown you, but it ends up being worse than just using one iteration of loft queue. Now, the other thing I want to show is um, the case where I did a full fine tuning. So I'll do git switch to multi GPU because that's where I had to run the model. I wanted to run with a batch uh, size uh, effectively of 32. I guess I could have run it on one GPU just using gradient accumulation. So here we are on the multi GPU branch and I have some results on the full fine tuning. So I just want to show you here uh, 1e minus 5, the fine tuning. And with full fine tuning, it's listing out the correct uh, eight planets. Uh, it tells us a bit about materials and it does tell us quite a bit more. So it kind of blabs on and it doesn't actually finish within the max tokens I've said. So I would say that it hasn't progressed as far in the full fine tuning as it did in LoRa because LoRa allows us to accelerate things a bit. And when it comes to the Fibonacci series, um, you can see it gets the Fibonacci numbers and it adds them together and prints the sum. Um, so the full fine tuning is also good in terms of quality. So when I go back and, um, by the way, I'll just show you if you do it with the learning rate of 1e minus uh, 4, you can see the generated responses are um, just uh, garbage in this case. So pretty much the performance matches these bars here. The full fine tuning, it gets the Fibonacci question correct, but it blabs on for the planets. Laura and QLaura get both questions correct and succinct. And LoftQ, um, the Fibonacci question is not quite right because it doesn't add the numbers together. And that's it for this illustration of full fine tuning versus LoRa, QLaura, and LoftQ. If you want to check out the scripts in detail, you can buy lifetime access over on trellis.com slash advanced dash fine dash tuning. Now, if you just want to do some unslot fine tuning, you can do it for free in a collab notebook. And that's possible just by going over to the unslot GitHub, where you'll find a number of collab notebooks for getting you started quickly. Let me know your questions on any of this fine tuning. If you have differences of opinion on how to select the parameters based on what you found in experience or theory, I'd be interested to know more. Cheers.